Uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is the fourth uh, seminar we have in this series on transport properties uh, in the VVSC, uh, within the VVSC. Uh, today we have the honor of having Dr. Victor Geskin and he is a principal research engineer at Linköping University. Uh, you have uh, long experience on electrochemistry, theoret theoretical chemistry, and atomic force microscopy. And uh, today you will give us a lecture on ion transport in electrolytes and membranes. And the way we have it is usually that, that uh, there's a presentation uh, around 45 minutes or so, or a little longer, and then we have breakout rooms. We'll see how many we are at the end, but the aim is to have a few breakout rooms where we can discuss things to ask Victor uh, when we come back, so to say. So please, go ahead. Uh, Mikael and Linda, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored and uh, somewhat humbled because I'm not the specialist in membranes. I'm coming from the electrochemical side. So what I will be mainly doing in this lecture, and I hope it can be useful for those who are not acquainted with membranes as well as myself, uh, I will try to ask uh, to answer the questions I had myself when I was entering this field. Right. Thanks. So, um, <clears throat> uh, general introduction: ion transport and membranes in electrochemistry. So I will always be talking from the electrochemicals. So if we imagine a chemical reaction, everyone knows from uh, even not high school, but primary school, if you put a nail, iron nail into a solution of copper salt, uh, there will be a chemical reaction. Copper will be uh, deposited on, on the surface of iron and some iron will be dissolved. It is a redox reaction, but we are not getting electricity from it. If we want to make a battery from it, if we want to make, to um, uh, get electricity out of this reaction, we need to uh, not to let electrons uh, exchange directly between uh, one component and the other. So what should we do? We need to separate the two couples. We can separate it like this. Uh, iron metal will be uh, in contact with its own salt. Copper metal will be in contact with its own salt. And then the electrons to be <clears throat> exchanged between these two reactants need to pass through the external chain, which will let us uh, give us an opportunity to uh, use um, electricity. But we need to maintain uh, the neutrality of the solution, so we need some ionic code. Here it is made with uh, with a salt fish, but. Uh, how can we do it better? We can do it better with uh, with a membrane. So uh, in the electrochemistry, the membrane uh, or some sort of ionic conductor is sort of at the heart of it all, though we electrochemists often forget about it. Uh, so um, we need to separate intelligently to maintain ionic communication between uh, two uh, redox couples, but uh, these communications should not be electronic. So a membrane can be defined as a molecularly selective barrier. It allows some species to pass through, but stops others. We will discuss who is passing through, who is stopped. Uh, a membrane itself can play the role of electrolyte, we will see. Uh, when the membrane is an electronic conduct, uh, an ionic conductor. And uh, the word perm selective is used here. So perm selectivity, it means that uh, there is some sort of selection based off charge. It can be uh, positive, negative charge. It can be selection between the same sign of charge, but uh, multiply or singly charged ions. It can be size selection of reagents. It can be ion specific. Now, uh, membranes and separators. We will be interested in membranes, but we will, uh, but it is uh, useful to um, precise what is not a membrane. So a separator also separates, but it is not um, molecularly selective. It has 
huge pores uh, at the molecular uh, scale. And uh, separators are also used in electrochemistry in traditional batteries, starting from the Volta uh, pile, where the coins were selected by separators, impregnated uh, tissue. And uh, in the very modern lithium ion batteries, also separators are used. But separators are not what we are interested in. <clears throat> we are mostly interested in uh, our group in a different sort of batteries, which are flow batteries. Flow battery, um, the difference between the flow battery and uh, uh, the batteries we have in our mobile phones or computers is that it's huge. As you see here, uh, it contains a lot of electrolyte. This electrolyte is flow circulated through a, an electrochemical cell. And the same problem of separation uh, is of uh, reactants is here, but we are separating two liquid, two liquid electrolytes. So uh, um, a separator at diaphragm is clearly not what we want. We want a really molecular ionic level of separation. Uh, and so a membrane uh, that we are always using in the flow battery uh, faces a long list of requirements. Uh, ionic conductivity, because we need to uh, maintain contact. Ion selectivity or some other sort of selectivity, because we don't want to electrolyze mix. If they mix, we kill electrochemistry, as the first slide suggests. Of course, it should be mechanically stable to some extent. It, it, can be, it must be chemically stable because these electrolytes can be quite aggressive. And of course, we want it all and we want it cheap. Now, uh, uh, concerning se selectivity, really not, re not only ion selectivity. As already mentioned, it can be uh, indeed ion selectivity based on electroselectivity. It can be steric, it, and it can be some sort of specific interactions. This list is from um, borrowed from the lecture, Professor Cohen. Materials. Uh, a lot of different words are used here, so I would like to um, guide you through the words, what we are talking about. Uh, on this, I'm based on uh, the definitions from Gold Book, EUPAC Gold Book, which is a good starting point. So uh, as we're talking about iron, uh, iron exchanger is uh, just some materials uh, which contains exchangeable ions. So of course our membrane should be an iron exchange. There is a lot of text on these slides because I thought that if someone would want to use this lecture later, it would be sort of like, uh, like a handbook. Uh, iron alert. Uh, ionomer is a polymer uh, containing uh, ionizable groups. So these ionizable groups are really a constituent part of this polymer. So they are chemically bound to the, to the backbone of it. Usually ionomer uh, contains a lot of such groups and this can cause microphase, microphase separation. We will see uh, an example very soon. Uh, polyelectrolyte is basically the same thing as ionomer, but uh, the quantity of groups is not specified. And ionomer, uh, well, polyelectrolyte can be just uh, water soluble, for example, it's poly having sulfonides, so something like this. So, and ionomer is, of course, a polyelectrolyte, and our membrane is usually a polyelectrolyte, the material from which membrane is made. There is something else which is not ionomer, and th this is solid polymer electrolyte. The difference is that this is uh, the uh, ionic groups are not constituent part of this polymer. They are not chemically bound. It is just a solution of salt in a polymer. So um, a prototypical compound like this is uh, lithium salt dissolved in uh, polyoxyethylene. So here you can separate uh, you 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 can the uh, salt can leak out of electrolytes. Solid polymer electrolyte is not what we want for a membrane. Uh, 
uh, in aqueous redox low bed. But solid polymer electrolyte can be used in lithium ion battery, for example, because there are no way to leak out. Uh, these are called um, also solid state electrolytes, super ionic conductors, fast ionic conductors. I think simply different people started doing this research and everyone coined a different term. And uh, that's why we have such a zoo of terms. Uh, so uh, super ionic ceramics, again, uh, inorganic material, uh, iron conducting, can be useful for uh, fuel cells, high temperature fuel cells for lithium batteries, but it is, you can make membranes of it. Uh, these membranes are not mechanically wonderful, but they can be of use in different application areas, such as, as I said, fuel cells, uh, in particular high temperature fuel cells. So this is what we are not talking about, but it is difficult. It is important to delimit our uh, subject. So now we are with ionomers, basically. So the um, materials that have uh, constituent ionic groups, uh, ionizable groups, and I would like to start with some thermodynamics of charge selectivity, which is done in effect. And uh, I really think that it is important to remind those even who know uh, what it is. And on this, it is very pedagogically uh, convenient to base on uh, the paper, old paper, more than 100 years old, by George Frederick Donald himself. He published this in, it, it in, German, in German, but uh, uh, it was translated into English, so it um, can be read. And so the idea of Donald effect is very simple. So we have our ion number, which has immobile ions. They are immobile in a polymer simply because they are chemically attached to the background. Imagine a, back, a, a, a backbone, sorry, not background, backbone of this polymer to which sulfonate groups, for example, are, are, are attached. They are ionic negative ions, but they cannot leave the polymer because they are chemically attached. These groups are, of course, neutralized by something, let's say by mobile sodium ion. And the question is, what happens to this system if in the outer solution we have just a solution of sodium chloride? Uh, there is no chloride inside initially, so it means that chloride would tend to distribute equally by diffusion between these two phases. But, sodium, but chloride cannot enter alone electron neutrality should be maintained. Sodium will drag, uh, sorry, chloride would drag sodium with it in the same quantity. But there is already enough sodium inside. So uh, equal distribution of chloride would be impossible. So this leads to the establishment of some sort of thermodynamic equilibrium. And thermodynamic equilibrium uh, means that we can write down a constant, which will be one if we are in equilibrium. <clears throat> and this allows us to uh, determine the distribution of this um, mobile ions uh, between the two phases. That's all for uh, Donan effect. And uh, now the consequences from this very simple situation. Uh, I will not walk you through in detail through it. You can do it afterwards, but the uh, you see from this very simple uh, relationship, we can see that if our concentration of mobile ions inside the polymer is high compared to the outer solution, then what happens here is something that people call coal ion exclusion. We see that not more coal ions, that is the ions of the same charge that the immobile, if we had immobile negative, uh, mobile chloride would be uh, coal ion. Coal ion is not allowed inside. 
because of this equilibrium. But if the outer solution is concentrated and we have the same concentration, the same order of magnitude of the concentration of uh, uh, mobile ions and immobile ions, the Donan effect is completely suppressed and the distribution will be uh, most symmetric. So uh, to uh, sort of summarize it all, if we have immobile, let's say, anions inside our polymer, and we have a diluted solution outside, mobile anions will not be allowed in high concentration inside. But if the concentration of the outer solution is high compared to the concentration of immobile ions, Donan effect will be completely suppressed. So this is this exclusion of mobile co-ions is what is called Donan exclusion. Uh, now, uh, very often, unfortunately, this situation is completely misunderstood because you can find if you can find it normally figures like this immobile anions shown here mobile anions are shown that they are sort of repelled looks like uh, indeed it is shown that there are mobile sodium ions but it is not clear if they belong really or not to this if you look at this figure without thinking what you think is that yes i understand mobile anions are repelled by immobile anions inside and unfortunately sometimes in literature you can find donan repulsion donan repulsion is not about electrostatics as i have shown in my demonstration it about it's about thermodynamics and why I think that it's important to understand it, because electrostatic works at any concentration. If it were about electrostatics, you would not understand why Donan would be suppressed in concentrated outer solution. But as it is thermodynamics, the situation becomes more complicated. So a Donan exclusion relies on thermodynamics, and indeed, if we have a lot of immobile ions inside and a low concentration of mobile ions outside, yes, mobile co-ions are excluded. Not but if you have a lot, uh, Donan effect is completely suppressed. And we can forget about Donan effect in concentrated outer solutions. Why I'm stressing this? Because in uh, our flow battery electrochemistry, we tend to work without concentrated solutions. So yes, we remember about Donan, but it is not extremely important for us. Uh, and now, uh, what is our ion exchange membrane? Because we are using our, are using ion exchange membranes in our batteries. So it's a polymer matrix where we have an ionomer that is a polymer containing constituent attached to the backbone immobile groups. And of course, they are compensated by counter ions. So what is shown here is cation exchange membranes because we have immobile anions and cations are counter ions, which are mobile. And of course, if we have one sort of cation, it can be exchanged for, exchanged for another sort of cation. And we have therefore cation exchange membrane cation exchange membrane is anionic so the constituent ions immobile ions are anions it is cation exchange uh, so cem cation exchange membrane aam anion exchange membrane uh, and the special very important class is pem proton exchange membranes where uh, we will see now uh, what is special about those. Uh, when we were building our model of membrane here, uh, we were talking just about one phase and the other phase. We were talking about two phases. So our membrane 
inner model was structureless. It was not uh, considered that there, uh, there are some pores or there is some internal structure. It was a, just a thermodynamic consideration of two phases, aqueous phase and the membrane phase, a different phase. Uh, in reality, a membrane can be dense, which means that, uh, yes, there are pores, but maybe they are, they are so impenetrable that you can forget about them that they do not constitute a thermodynamic phase. But on the other side of this, uh, I would say, research, people uh, became interested in a completely different material, which is a material made of well-defined nanopores. And the question is, is a membrane made of nanopores behaving the same way or not? And actually it does, and uh, quite surprisingly, a theoretical work where it was really uh, nailed down correctly is quite recent. Uh, it shows that uh, donor equilibria are applicable to uh, nanopores in the same way as it is applicable to structurous membranes. And uh, they nicely write there that notice that there is no membrane considered here between the left bulk solution and the left inlet of the nanochannel here, the equilibrium here. The donor equilibrium is essentially electrochemical equilibrium, which is available for any equilibrium system with or without membrane. So it's about thermodynamics, it's about phase. One more um, uh, reminder that it is not about electrostatics. Of course, the electrostatics is hidden somewhere because we maintain electroneutrality, but not more than that. And the role of um, concentration of immobile charges uh, is the uh, surface charge density of the chemicals. So, uh, it means that we should not um, really bother a lot uh, about understanding the structure of our membrane. It is, is it porous? Is it dense? Uh, thermodynamic behavior is the same. Uh, now, if we have unequal distribution of mobile ions. We have uh, ion exclusion, we said. We had more mobile ions outside the membrane than inside. Uh, it means that something uh, does not let the ions enter. We can say that it's an entropy effect, but uh, we can express it as appearance of some potential, dominant potential, at the phase boundary between the two solutions, that sort of repels uh, ions outside, the potential that effectively repels. Uh, and uh, there is a long formula I'm not showing here, but the approximate formula, the long formula can be found, for example, in this reference. But uh, the approximate formula is just, it's, um, it depends on the ratio on the concentration of immobile ions inside and mobile outside as simple as that. And you see that if the concentration of mobile ions outside is on the same order of magnitude that uh, as uh, immobile inside, uh, logarithm of one will be zero and there will be no donor potential uh, drop at the limit between the membrane and solution and no donor uh, exclusion. Uh, of course, in the membrane, which has some finite thickness, uh, there is uh, some diffusion potential. Uh, and uh, finally, the membrane potential, which is the difference between uh, the potentials between solution at one side of the membrane and solution at the other side of the membranes, two donor potentials at two boundaries, and uh, membrane potential inside should be taken uh, sorry, diffusion potential inside should be taken into account, and all this gives rise to the membrane potential, which is measurable. We can measure the potential difference between the two solutions. And then it becomes interesting uh, because um, as it is easily measurable, of course, you need to do it carefully and correctly, but it, it is doable. Uh, if we get just uh, Nernst uh, potential difference between the two solutions, 
uh, means that the membrane is completely impenetrable for, for ions. Only counter ions can pass. This is the ideal case, which never happens. And in reality, um, you can imagine the other limiting case where your membrane is just a filter paper, everything passes through. Uh, there will be no potential difference between the two solutions because, because they will be mixing. And in between the two, the membrane with some uh, non-ideal but still uh, perm selectivity, that can be characterized by transference numbers. And uh, ideal transference numbers is one for the ion uh, allowed to pass, zero for the ion which is not allowed to pass, but in reality, it will be not one and non-zero. And I, if there is complete lack of selectivity, uh, transference numbers will be one half for each ion. So, uh, therefore, with uh, by measuring potential difference between the two solutions, we can uh, measure transference numbers of a membrane, very simple. Uh, so a good membrane, a good ion selective membrane will have uh, higher ion selectivities uh, for the um, counter ion that is allowed to pass, which means at the same time that co-ions will not be allowed. And it depends on the nature of ion proton. It's not the same thing as uh, potassium plus, and it is not the same thing as doubly charged ion, but we will not go into this detail. Uh, now, uh, from theory to something uh, real, uh, the best ionomer uh, we have uh, for membranes and uh, something we need to replace, and why. So, Nafion was invented in the 70s. Uh, it was invented by DuPont, and later other companies uh, started uh, preparing similar polymers under, they are a bit different. They have different names. They have a lot of applications in electrochemical devices. You will sell flow batteries, electrolyzers, and also in humidif humidification systems. Uh, because uh, fuel cells uh, working in electric cars, for example, need um, air of certain humidity. And again, nafion is um, used uh, to uh, maintain the uh, humidity of the air uh, needed. So why nafion is so wonderful? Uh, by its structure. So nafion is a copolymer which has a, a super hydrophobic backbone, uh, perfluorinated, it's basically Teflon. <clears throat> uh, and also it has uh, uh, fluor sulfonic groups attached. So these are precisely the ionic groups. These groups are super acid. They are, uh, has the acidity stronger than sulfuric acid. And they are, of course, super hydrophilic. So we have a copolymer that has a super hydrophobic part and a super hydrophilic part on the same chain. It leads, of course, to uh, microphase separation. So uh, Nafion forms a very complicated um, cluster network, microstructure. Uh, there are uh, many, many people spending their entire careers studying Nafion. There was a chemical review uh, paper, uh, 100 pages long, in two, 2004. And in 2014, there was the next paper in chemical reviews on Nafion. Again, new understanding in this last two years, in the last 10 years. So this microstructure of Nafion creates uh, a very um, convenient pathways for products. So nafion is a great proton conductor with high conductivity and um, in principle good um, ion selectivity. So nafion is, is indeed a great polymer, but um, uh, it has of course strong points that I have already uh, mentioned, high proton conductivity, indeed it's, it's mechanically stable. 
It's thermally stable, it's chemically stable. Fluorinated polymers are very chemically stable. But this chemical stability precisely is, uh, as it is understood now, it's drawback because it is uh, non-recyclable. It is immortal. You can do nothing with nafion. It is polyfluorinated um, compound. Uh, nafion is not yet facing a uh, uh, European Union ban. European, U European Union actually is uh, uh, pre preparing to ban um, low molecular weight uh, PFAS. But of course, everyone understands that nafion will not survive for a very long time. So it is from the environment. Nafion is very expensive. Uh, nafion, basically, there is platinum also in the fuel cells, but nafion uh, for the fuel cells of cars makes them very expensive. There are some problems with water management because uh, nafion, as you have seen in the previous slide, needs water to be conducted. It means that uh, dry nafion is not protein conducting. That's why water management is expensive and, and complicated if we deal with nafion. In some cases, it's it's poorly selective. I will demonstrate it immediately. Uh, yes, and so um, um, a recent review was which was uh, entitled "The Promising Future of Fluoropolymers." It was the year twenty, but now we see that there is no future for fluoropolymers. We need to uh, look for something else. But of course, it, it remains as ionomer as a membrane material. It is wonderful. So we have a hard competitor in in the in that uh, When I uh, in the title, when I say that it is overused and um, problems with uh, uh, selectivity, for example, vanadium flow batteries are among the uh, maybe the most developed uh, battery flow battery existing. Among the species used in vanadium battery is uh, this uh, compound of vanadium-4, uh, VO sulfate. Uh, so uh, it's a salt, of course, but it turns out that uh, it is dissociated in diluted solution. It's a salt. But in, in a flow battery, as I said already once, we want to have the solution as concentrated as we can. And it turns out that this... Um, Vanadium OSO4 is a very weak electrolyte. In concentrated electrolytes, it is practically not dissociated. It is soluble, but not dissociated, which means that um, if we wanted to play with uh, uh, ion selective properties, uh, no way, we have no ions here. So what remains only sieving, only the size of the channels. Do we need such an intelligent thing as nafion here? Probably not, but nafion is very chemically stable. And by the way, um, nafion is a cation exchanger. One would think that uh, for a cation as VO, uh, we would need an ion, we would rather need an ion exchanger to block these cations because we don't want them to pass. But for two reasons, we don't care. One reason is that the solution is concentrated. Um, Donon exclusion would be uh, suppressed. And in addition, uh, it is not dissociated, no ions. So finally, uh, very counterintuitively, uh, we are using nafion in spite of the fact that there are no ions and in spite of the fact that it is a proton conductor where logically we would need uh, ion exchanger, an ion exchanger, but an ion exchanger uh, is not that great in this situation. Again, this is an example from uh, Professor Kohler. Uh, now finished with thermodynamics, kinetics, finally ion conductivity. Uh, why ions should move somewhere? They have three uh, uh, possible um, driving forces. One is migration that is uh, under the action of uh, potential difference or electric field. 
So minus somewhere plus somewhere, uh, the ions would move to the opposite side. Uh, another driving force is diffusion. Uh, if uh, the concentration is high somewhere, then uh, all the ions here, they are, uh, the sign of their charge doesn't matter, uh, would move um, opposite to the um, concentration gradient. And convection, which means that macroscopically all the, all the solution is just uh, flowing due to some external uh, pressure. All these factors are taken into account into Nernst Planck equation that uh, theoretical people are using uh, to uh, simulate uh, ionic transport. We have a term, uh, so the flux, which means uh, how many moles per square centimeter are uh, moving in our solution. Flux depends on diffusion related to concentration gradient and uh, uh, how uh, fast the ions can move is given by the diffusion coefficient. There is migration where the gradient of uh, potential is uh, given and it would depend on um, concentration, of course, and mobility and convection. If we forget about convection for the moment, uh, diffusion and uh, diffusion coefficient and mobility are related by um, a very simple relationship, which has, uh, you can take a look how it is uh, derived, but uh, basically it is saying that whatever the driving force, it is the property of your medium that defines how mobile the ions are, uh, no matter if they are pushed by uh, uh, gradient of concentration or by the gradient of uh, potential. Basically, mobility and diffusion coefficient is the same thing. They have different dimensions, but it's the same thing because they are related by a universal constants and stem. Uh, now, conductivity. Conductivity is uh, uh, defined for the movement of ions due to migration. Uh, it is just flux. Uh, so this is current, flux uh, times uh, current density, rather. Uh, uh, flux uh, moles per centimeter square times charge. And uh, current divided by um, uh, gradient of potential is uh, what is called conductivity. It can be defined for every component I. And total conductivity uh, would be the sum of all the conductivities. And as we see that different ions have different mobilities, it means that every ion contributes a different amount, different share to uh, the total current we have. We can um, determine transport numbers. It's the fraction of current carried by this particular ion. We have seen transference numbers before, now transport numbers. There is some confusion with the uh, terminology. Basically, it is the same thing, ideally. Re in reality, it is not because uh, transference numbers were determined for a static situation. There was a membrane, and we measured potential difference at both sides of the membrane. No current. Here, current is flowing. So, um, as thermodynamics can be different from kinetics, transport numbers and transference numbers can be different. But once again, sometimes uh, they are called uh, in a different way. Both are called uh, in the same way. So, you need to check what people are talking uh, So, uh, it is interesting to see where uh, we can aim with the ion conductivity of an electron. So if we take this basic relationship given in the previous page, uh, if we take some reasonable concentrations, uh, or rather just, uh, if we take a reasonable mobility that we calculate from Einstein relationship for a reasonable diffusion coefficient, and the diffusion coefficient of practically anything in water is on this order of magnitude, uh, we will not discuss why. 
then we can calculate the typical mobility. And from this typical mobility, we can calculate the typical conductivity, which will be um, on the order of uh, uh, 40 Siemens centimeters square per mole, which means that uh, if you have one molar solution of your salt, uh, of your electrolyte, your um, ionic conductivity will be in the range of millisiemens per centimeter. It means that you cannot jump higher than that unless you know how to improve uh, mobility of KCL in water. This is your limit. So it means that the best aqueous electrolytes will have the uh, ion conductivities for one molar solution on the order of millisiemens per centimeter. And you can imagine that an ionomer can be worse than that. So nafion is practically as good as, as that. If you open uh, the handbooks, it's 10 millisiemens per centimeter proton conductivity for nafion. So you see that in nafion, practically, it's proton in water running away. You cannot have the conductivity better than nafion. Is it important for flow batteries? Maybe we don't care. So if again, we make an order of magnitude estimate, we will see that if we have nafion sort of conductivity, 10 millisiemens per centimeter, if we have a membrane 100 microns thick, which sort of we need to have to ensure uh, good mechanical properties, uh, and if we have current density on the order of uh, 100 milliamps per centimeter square, it's what we usually aim at in good flow batteries. Very simple uh, Ohm law estimate shows that we are losing 0, 1 volt on the membrane. And the voltage we want to get is on the order of 1 volt. So with this highly conducting membranes, we are losing 10%. If our membrane is worse than that, it means that we will be losing more, or we will have a mem we will have to have the membrane thinner. Membrane thinner means we are less sure about uh, mechanical properties. So we are really at the critical um, boundary here. So we critically need high ionic conductivities in the membranes. We do care. But on this, at the same time, uh, we need to have the membrane selected. And you imagine that if a membrane is very nicely ion conductive, maybe it's not that nicely selected. So here, uh, just uh, again from Professor Croyer's example, uh, he considers different membranes, nafion and other, 10 micron thick and 100 micron thick. And you see basically what I uh, told you, 400 microamps per centimeter square. With nafion, it's okay. With, with bad membranes, it's not okay. Energy efficiency falls down to unacceptably low values. So yes, we need good membranes. Uh, we are testing membranes for their ionic conductivity. Uh, um, so uh, it's just IV curve. Uh, so voltage here, uh, we apply voltage, we measure potential. At first, it is really ohmic, the conductivity of the membranes. At some point, it saturates. It saturates, why? Because if uh, uh, you, you, you hit the um, conductivity limit of the, of the membrane, uh, the ions are depleted at the boundary, one boundary and the other boundary. It's what is called concentration polarization. And even if we increase the voltage, we cannot increase the current because there are no ions uh, to um, conduct this current in the vicinity of, of the membrane. And if we go further, we increase the current still more. Uh, but here, different uh, complicated phenomena are happening. I will see my polar membranes because it is not essential. Uh, and I will go to solid transport. Uh, so ions are transported, of course, but ions are not uh, 
alone there is only sol also solvent, which is uh, water in most uh, interesting cases. And uh, water is, of course, just let me remind you, tends to equalize its own chemical potential at both sides. It means in diluted solution, you have higher chemical potential of water, let's say high concentration of water, uh, to put it primitively, and the water will tend to go on the other side. Is it important? Yes. Because osmotic pressure is extremely high. It is easy to estimate that osmotic pressure is 25 atmospheres per mole of solute. And the mole of solute is basically um, a salty water, ocean water. It's it's one molar solution, and uh, it's so you imagine your, that your membrane will experience a pressure of twenty five atmospheres of water if your concentration is not balanced on both sides and not balanced by one mole. So yes, uh, it's a pre it's a problem in. Uh, uh, flow batteries that water will permeate from one side to the other. We need to balance uh, very carefully the concentrations on both sides. Uh, and, um, and that's it. And in addition to osmosis just uh, uh, free of any electrostatic considerations, we have also electroosmosis in the solutions of electrolyte. Because in our electrolytes we have ions, of course, and these ions are experiencing migration in the electric field, but ion is migrating together with its uh, solvent shell. Ions are solvated. So when ion is migrating somewhere, it is dragging water. And again, uh, we cannot stop migration of ions through the membrane because it's it's why we are using the membrane we need to maintain it but we don't want ions to uh, drag water uh, which is a complicated task of course and something even worse is happening in um, flow batteries uh, when the membranes were checked uh, in um, organic flow batteries uh, it was seen that crossover it means that um, the crossover of um, our organic molecules uh, through the membrane from one side of the flow battery to the other side of the flow battery um, is practically independent of the quality of the membrane as it is measured without current. Without current, we can measure the permeability of the membrane for our organics. And then when the current is on, this electrosmotic drag is on because uh, electric current, electronic current in the outer shell, in the outer circuit has to be uh, matched by the ionic current inside. Uh, so we have uh, 100 milliamps per square centimeter of ionic current, a lot of ions, a lot of ions dragging a lot of water. And this water is dragging with itself uh, organic compounds. So uh, the word counterintuitively appeared in this eye opener that was this paper that we need to check membranes under current. So of course we need to screen membranes first. If our membrane is very bad, we can throw it away. But uh, if a membrane is good without current, it doesn't mean that it will be good with current, which makes the situation complicated, but at least it is clear that uh, which phenomenon is to blame is electroosmosis, which is bad. Okay. We want our membranes to be uh, hydrophobic, not to let water inside, but still iron conduct. Uh, my time is practically over, but this is the last short section, which is sort of publicity. Why this talk in the Wallenberg Wood Science Center, because as you understood, nafilon is great, but we need to replace it. And uh, we started working together with Cotejo uh, on um, cellulose-based membranes. Uh, so just a word about cellulose-based membranes. 
uh, I don't need to say a lot in this audience what is cellulose. And when cellulose microfibrils and then nanofibrils finally are obtained, uh, people in uh, Koteho uh, has, have learned how to chemically modify this uh, cellulose, this nanocellulose. Uh, at the same time, ionic groups are introduced here, so we can say that they are preparing ionomer from cellulose. Cellulose was not an ionomer, and now it is. And at the same time, uh, these nanofibers are cross-linked. Uh, they are cross-linked to, uh, I would say, to, to make uh, a, a solid uh, stick material that sticks together, that, that is not disintegrating into fibrils. And also we can regulate um, more or less the size of the pores, because if your pore is uh, too huge, uh, it will not be a membrane, it will be just a pore. Uh, two methods already used, one with uh, hemiacetal crosslinks and sulfonates as ionic groups. Uh, the other method included carboxylated, carboxylated uh, links, including carboxy groups, which were linking, uh, which were cross-linking and introducing ionic components at the same time. The properties are different because sulfonate is a strong, um, strong group almost dissociated carboxylic group is not that strong so there is some ph dependence in ion exchange properties i will not say more uh two phd theses were defended by our wonderful uh phd students san lander and hongri young uh and uh, san lander is now working in a spin-off company that was born from this work so this is how these membranes look they look right and uh, the spin-off company is the last um, slide of what I took from their web page. Uh, they are very um, successful in uh, developing new cellulose-based membranes beyond uh, what I uh, showed now. And these cellulose membranes, okay, I will not, the cell film membranes, uh, they are maybe not uh, at, in all parameters better than Nafion, but they have already good uh, ionic conductivity. Uh, their, their selectivity maybe is not that good, but uh, they are approaching it. And of course, uh, needless to say, it's a nice green material. So um, uh, we are confident and they are confident that uh, there is a bright future for cellulose-based ion selective and uh, selective in a broader uh, sense, membranes for electrochemical devices. Uh, almost in time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Victor, for a very nice presentation, starting with theory and then going to some practicalities or pra uh, some applications. Uh, Linda, what do you say? Uh, shall we take uh, uh, ten minutes? Uh, is that enough to to go into to um, um, separate rooms and then back, and then we ask Victor a lot of questions? What do you say? Maybe fifteen minutes. To have okay. a fifteen minutes. People are usually a bit dropping off. We'll see, but. Uh, um, as yeah, but can. usually not when they're in the rooms. So, yeah, okay. So you put us in in. Yeah, I will do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe. So now we will. Please don't leave. <laughs> We're making two rooms. Uh, let's see. Maybe it's rooms. Or maybe only two rooms, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe two rooms. Mm -hmm. 